So hello everyone and bonjour tout le monde. Thank you very much for joining Doi AI Institute Canada for today's panel discussion on AI in life science and healthcare. My name is Jason Gray, and I lead Deloitte's government and public service and life sciences and healthcare practice for their Omnia data and AI program. So just before we begin, I'd like to start with uh, land acknowledgement. We do acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. Deloitte Canada has offices with representation across most of the country. We acknowledge that our offices reside on traditional treaty and unceded territories as part of Turtle Island and is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Lastly, the web webcast is being recorded and will be made available on the Deloitte AI Institute webpage, and you'll be able to view this video in the language of your preference. Okay, so just to get started, a little bit of upfront context. We, we I think, all know that AI in healthcare is truly starting to push the boundaries of what is possible, and is captivating the imagination and creativity of those looking to create meaningful change across the sector. However, I think we can probably also acknowledge that AI in healthcare has really only scratched the surface of its full potential. There has been accelerated use of AI for certain things, including automating repetitive tasks, standardizing business processes. But increasingly, we're seeing AI being recognized as a, as a strategic business advantage as actively being discussed at the board and C-suite levels. When we reflect on what's driving this demand, we have to look at what's happening in ecosystem and some of the immediate needs, as well as the changing demographics of the healthcare system, where that system is facing increasing and growing demand for the services, including rising costs, resource constraints, and, and increasing administrative burden. It's estimated that by 2050, one in four people in North America will be over the age of 65, meaning that the health systems are going to have to adjust to deal with more patients with more complex care needs. And the reality is that managing some of these patients is expensive and requires systems to shift from more episodic care to one that's more proactive, focused on prevention and long-term care management. In building a healthier future, we can thrive in. This is where we see the potential and opportunities created by AI. And it's no surprise, um, and you know, even in the last week or two, we've seen an amplified focus on the adoption of AI uh, and more so adoption of AI in healthcare. What are we seeing? We're seeing an increased use of AI powered chatbots and virtual assistants that help patients access the, the information and as well as schedule appointments and increasingly help them to navigate the healthcare system itself. We're also seeing AI leverage to remotely monitor patients within the comfort of their homes and using AI to plan for more operational efficiencies where there's either projected shortfalls in resource management or where there's a desire to apply those resources more effectively and efficiently. So lots of promise, certainly in AI and healthcare, but what really needs to change to encourage the introduction and scaling of AI in health? So at a high level, and we'll get into some more detail as we go to the panel, requires people, processes, and technology really to work in harmony. We have to ensure patients trust. We have to upscale some of our talents. We have to have a clearly defined digital strategy along with ways of measuring the return on investments of looking at AI and how it integrates into the healthcare system. And those are some of the top concerns that, that have been to date, hindering to some degree some of the progress of successful AI adoption in, in many of the parts of the healthcare sector. So I'm going to go ahead to the next slide. So when we start to think about you know, what does AI-enabled healthcare look like in the future, and you can see this is by no means an exhaustive list, but some of the things that are, again, are, are emerging as some of the trends where AI can, again, either currently or in a future state, directly impact on how healthcare is delivered. So we've done some surveys within Deloitte and, and within one of the AI dossier, we found 80% of survey respondents reveal they expect AI and machine learning to improve treatment recommendations for individuals. And then similarly, over the next three to five years, that AI is expected to have a transformational impact as 50% of global companies will implement some form of AI strategy by 2025. And again, with all this buzz, it's important to keep in mind that AI in healthcare is still in its relative infancy. And so that the scope of that impact, the timing of the impact is, is all yet to come. Today, most of the use cases for AI and healthcare really focus on administrative tasks, basic automation as, you know, rather than some of the more uh, use case driven, sophisticated clinical applications, including clinical decision support and care delivery. Um, but some of those more advanced AI applications are already emerging that look at the practical viability of some more sophisticated use case, including again, in assisting radiologists in things like um, uh, image diagnosis. 
But for most organizations, the single most important AI building block is data. It's getting access to the rich data that AI systems require and then managing the data in a coordinated way across the enterprise. So some of the major priorities that we've seen across the industry include a deeper understanding of the healthcare consumer is foundational. So you've got a huge array of technology options. You've got lots of use cases. You've got a huge amount of data within the healthcare system, a lot of market hype. But again, there, there is a primary need for healthcare organizations to use data analytics to, to deeply understand their consumer, whatever that, whether that's public, whether that's patients, whether it's clinicians, better understanding their needs to drive those needs back to understand again, what are the data constraints and or opportunities that exist within their, within their organizations. We also see AI shifting to execution at scale. So it's been, there's been lots of history of you know, big ideas, lots of innovation pilots, sandbox environments, but what most healthcare leaders are really looking for is again, practical technologies and practices to start to deliver AI at scale. And that we're also looking at how AI can start to shift the economics of healthcare data sharing. So those of us in the system know the cost of, of maintaining and growing the health data ecosystem is massive. AI offers opportunities to make the, both the cost and the efficiency of healthcare data sharing more efficient and therefore again, more accessible for things like AI applications. And then finally, you know, we have seen some talent and governance barriers that are choking, you know, the value delivery of AI. The people side is struggling in the sense that, you know, we need to upskill people. We need to start to look at more um, appropriate and responsible methods of sharing data across ecosystems, whether it's more integrated care delivery system or whether it's just more prolific access to data. These things, again, are, are currently in, oftentimes stuck in, in practices and policies that are decades old. We need to evolve the thinking around how data is shared effectively and appropriately. So, you know, as AI becomes more of a standard business tool, organizations in healthcare and life sciences are going to need a more of a clear vision and strategy for how they're going to harness that power. And they need to start investing in some of the building blocks to develop those AI solutions at scale, including, as I already mentioned, some of the data infrastructure underneath. So, you know, looking at the current IT infrastructure, looking at the right talent and skill sets looking at, again, the ecosystem in which they operate so they can understand the needs of their key stakeholders. And as they start to think through those things, they start to understand like, what are some of the first, the quick wins, but also what are the, some of the initiatives where they can start the foundational work to drive to better data, more robust data for, again, available for AI use cases so they can start to scale it within organizations and throughout the system. So just in wrapping up, what we're going to explore in this webcast is how AI can support improvements in care outcomes, how it can target things like better patient experience and access to healthcare services. And we've got a, a panel of very esteemed leaders from within the system. We'll hear again how some of these applications are starting to roll out within the Canadian healthcare ecosystem. So before we, we turn it over to the panel, we are going to invite you to participate quickly in a poll. If you want to transition to the next one. So, you know, as a citizen, so again, many of you are, are practitioners within the healthcare system, but when you think about the system as a whole and as a citizen in that system, what ways would you envision AI transforming how you engage with that healthcare system? And we are asking you to kind of select your top choice, although many of these may apply. So if you can click on, again, which of these most resonates with you. If, if you have a fifth or beyond these particular options, feel free to enter additional ideas within the chat. But otherwise, if you can select which one of these, again, with most appropriately uh, characterize how you'd envision AI transforming your engagement with the healthcare system. We'll just give, uh, give everyone a short amount of time to enter their choice, and then we'll take a look at what's emerging as themes. And again, happy to welcome additional ideas in the webinar chat. Okay, why don't we take a look at, I think that's given us one question. Let's uh, take a look and thank we, we do actually see um, a few areas just within the chat, including AI use for patients to become agents of their own health. Uh, fantastic suggestion. Um, as well as some comments about, again, what's crucially important um, that the patient is not unduly stressed. So it looks like just based on the poll, 
that we've got um, a front runner, which is enhancing health outcomes, including tracking patient tracking symptoms. Uh, not surprisingly, because again, AI for the purpose of AI is not useful unless it's directly impacting on the experience, both of clinicians and, and of the people who are working with those clinicians. Okay. And you can see again, although there was a, you know, a front runner, clearly again, support for some of the other ones as well. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time introducing our panel. And again, the, and I'll be turning over to Asia to help to moderate some of the questions. So first uh, I'll introduce Dr. Mohamed Mandani. Uh, Dr. Mandani is Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Uni Health Toronto and Director of the University of Toronto's Temerity Faculty Medicine Center for Intelli Artificial Intelligence Research and Education in Medicine. That is a, that's a long one. <laughs> Dr. Mandani's team bridges advanced analytics, including machine learning with clinical management decision-making to improve patient outcomes and hospital efficiency. Uh, Dr. Mandani is also a professor in the Department of Medicine uh, at U of T, the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, at Dalalana. Uh, Dr. Mandani is also an adjunct senior scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and a faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. In 2010, Dr. Mandani was named among Canada's top 40 under 40 and has published over 500 studies in peer-reviewed medical journals. Dr. Mandani also obtained a doctor of pharmacy from the University of Michigan and completed a fellowship in pharmacoeconomics and outcomes research at the Detroit Medical Center. And during that fellowship, uh, obtained a Master of Arts degrees in economics from Wayne State University in Detroit with a concentration in econometric theory. As well, uh, Dr. Mandani completed a Master of Public Health degree from Harvard with a concentration in quantitative methods. And second, I'm really happy to welcome Jennifer Hayward, who's the Vice President of Business Transformation at SE Health. Jennifer is accountable for process technology and data solutions with centralized operational support to improve user experience, quality and performance across all lines of business and home office functional areas of SE Health. Jennifer has been integral in developing new solutions associated with new models of care and establishing the data strategy for SE Health, leveraging AI and analytics to enable data-driven decision-making within the organization. Uh, prior to joining SE Health, Jennifer spent uh, 18 years with Celestica, a global contract manufacturer, where she held various leadership roles in engineering, finance, operations, and account management. Jennifer has a Bachelor of Applied Science and Computer Engineering from U of T, and is a graduate of Rotman's Advanced Health Leadership Program. And finally, in her spare time, she enjoys cooking, traveling with her family, and being a pro bono Uber driver to her two daughters, which I can definitely relate to. So with that, I'm going to introduce Asia Green, who's a senior manager with our AI Institutes, and invites Asia to start moderating the panel. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jason, and welcome to all of our panelists. This is definitely going to be an interesting discussion, and uh, we welcome all of you to also uh, contribute to this conversation as well by posting your questions in the chat. So if we can advance to the next slide, wanted to start off in uh, just ground setting. Why is AI important for healthcare? So this is not only uh, meant to be a topical question, but really a relevant question. Love to start that with, with uh, you, Dr. Mohammed, and, and understanding sort of why do you think AI is important within the healthcare sector? Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, I, I think everybody's hearing from the headlines in the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and all sorts of media outlets how our healthcare system is in crisis. Um, we have fundamental issues, high patient volumes coupled with challenges in capacity and human resources will make for a highly constrained healthcare system. Uh, when we look at the essence of healthcare though, it's patient centric and data driven really at the end of the day. Um, and healthcare has a lot of data, right? If, if we look at um, a study from Royal Bank of Canada that suggests that of any sector, health has the highest annual growth rate when it comes to data of any sector. So we're, we're essentially uh, kind of drowning in data, uh, but it's challenging um, in, in terms of what to do with all that data. So if we look at uh, studies, uh, new studies published every two minutes, there's over 30 million studies that you could uh, uh, look at through PubMed. It just That's just research alone. And then of course, when you're actually going through the process of how you manage a patient, think about all that data that you have to process. When you look at a patient, the fundamental journey is around diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, and then sometimes revisiting. So when we think about a diagnosis, some diagnoses are very simple and straightforward. Others are not at all. 
Uh, so you have to consider things like family history, social history, labs, uh, order, uh, sorry, vitals. Um, we have to look at all sorts of other parameters around medical imaging findings. All of that stuff has to get processed in order to make a diagnosis. Um, when we look at prognosis, that will define how we actually or drive how we do treatment selection. So for example, if I make a diagnosis, and I'm going to actually just go back to diagnosis for, for just a sec, um, it's not as straightforward as people think. So for example, with something like asthma, now this is not an AI example, but simply how effective we are at making a diagnosis. Uh, there have been a few studies, one actually from in North York here in, in Canada that uh, looked at patients with asthma. So something is straightforward and common as asthma. I imagine lots of people here either have asthma or know of people who have asthma. Uh, they looked uh, at about 500 patients or so. They brought them in and said, you know, we're actually going, we know that you're, you've been diagnosed with asthma and you're being actively treated for asthma with inhaled steroids and, and the whole thing. Let's actually step back. We'll do proper spirometry. We'll pro do proper assessments and see if you actually have diagnosis. And almost a third of patients did not have asthma. So oftentimes we struggle with diagnosis. Then I'm gonna to go to treatment. Well, if I know this patient isn't going to do well, I'm gonna be much more aggressive with my treatment. But if this patient is, you know, they're not so bad, I, you know, they're, they're gonna be okay. I may be a little bit more careful with my treatments, pick something that's maybe not as toxic, um, have it has a favorable adverse event profile, maybe take a hit on it, effectiveness. But all that I have to figure out and there's study after study after study showing how terrible we are at prognosis. But that drives treatment, right? And then we get to treatment. Um, how many people here know people who have mental health illnesses like depression? Um, I can tell you a lot of physicians, what they'll do is they'll say, all right, uh, I've diagnosed as depression. And in many cases, it's not even depression, it's dysthymia. But let's say we've made the diagnosis. I've got, let's say, five or six different serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors to choose from. This is a common class of drugs that people go to. The way people typically make a decision is, let's try this one and see what happens. For multiple sclerosis, similar type of thing. Do we really have a definitive way of saying this is what we start with? No, a lot of times it's, I think we should try this and let's see what happens. There has to be a better way to do this. When we take a look at the average complex medical decision, it suggested that uh, it considers typically about a thousand parameters, a thousand parameters to make a complex medical decision. Now, when we look at um, uh, Miller's work from the 1950s, who's a famous psychologist, he famously concluded that the average human can process seven plus or minus two things at the same time. So a thousand versus seven, we don't have a chance, right? It's complicated and, and we need help. Uh, and we actually, when we look at uh, the types of, of practices that we have, some of the studies are suggesting that roughly 20% of patients get treatments that are not of proven effectiveness or even potentially harmful. That's uh, more than one in five. Um, and there's all sorts of other statistics about the inefficiencies and the challenges we have in healthcare of making good decisions. So where I see artificial intelligence as being incredibly relevant is it gives us the opportunity to process vast amounts of data in a manner that we as humans simply can't. And we can leverage this power to help us provide better, more timely, more effective, and more efficient care. That's a fantastic response. And uh, not only uh, something that gives justification as to why AI complements uh, some of our decision-making, but also, uh, maybe even demystify some of the things that are surrounded around um, some of the implications of making that decision. Want to switch it over to looking at more of the community side. And Jennifer, same question to you. Why is AI important for healthcare now? So uh, thanks, Aisha. I think I would um, echo actually a lot of uh, Dr. Mumdani's uh, sentiments. Um, not, I think very similar for, some are very similar for home care as they are in acute care. Um, you know, I agree data, you know, it's a, a data and evidence driven industry. There's a lot of data. I think from a home care perspective, um, we definitely have challenges in access to data. Uh, so access to data in home care can be very difficult. There's a lot of disparate data sets. And so um, from our side, I think there's a real hope that we can bring those uh, together in the future. If you can imagine as a home care provider, you know, a 
nurse or a PSW going into people's homes probably 10, 12, 15 visits a day, uh, traveling from home to home, uh, being able not to just provide quality care, but also to be able to assess you know, where, uh, where that patient is in their care plan, uh, take into account any other information from primary care providers or hospitals, um, and then be able to determine, you know, are there other integrated care solutions that can be, um, that can be applied to the client's care? Um, all those things are very difficult to do while, you know, driving to your next visit and trying to consume all that data. So I agree. I think, you know, going forward, there's a lot of um, opportunity for being able to help our care providers do that. Uh, specifically in the home care industry as well, uh, there are a lot of funding and resourcing challenges currently, uh, especially as a not-for-profit organization such as SE Health. Uh, there's not a lot of time for complex analyses, uh, and given the capacity shortages that we have, a lot of the work that we do, especially operational work we do, is very reactive. Um, in addition to the client care, our leadership teams, our clinical managers are responsible for operational management, uh, you know, making sure that we have the right resources, um, finding, you know, additional resources when there are gaps. And uh, when it comes to optimizing that, uh, these clinical managers may not be traditionally trained in that operational management area. So how do we provide the right tools to our teams, you know, to allow them to focus on quality client care? and then minimize the time that they're spending on that operational management, in, including capacity optimization. So ultimately where we've seen some opportunity is, you know, how can we use AI to enable decision-making, but ease that burden. Uh, and so allow our teams, you know, the speed of decision-making, allow us to pivot, and then also to anticipate rather than be reactive in their decision-making. So let's, uh, thank you for that, Jennifer. And you touched on something that I, I think is quite relevant to maybe a lot of people on the call, the people element. So certainly, um, you know, Dr. Mandati has provided an interesting as well as uh, clear justification as to why AI is important now, but conveying that to others uh, who are still maybe on the fence, um, see it as maybe a, an opportunity to take the decision-making away from them. How do you have those type of con conversations? How do you start to build um, it in so that uh, AI is no longer trying to compete with you, but is something that augments your decision-making? I, I do want to bring Jason into the fold, into helping uh, maybe answering, addressing that question, but uh, Mohammed, Jennifer, your, your initial thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can I can certainly uh, go forward in terms of um, some of the challenges. Uh, I guess is that the the question, Mauricia? So more um, along the challenge of, of of people element. So certainly you know, uh, getting their buy in, uh, awareness of how AI can actually complement uh, the work that they do. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it uh, revolves around literacy. Um, uh, there's data literacy. There's artificial intelligence literacy. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, you know, people will will understand concepts and such to a certain extent. But I think we need examples, actual real examples of where we've made an impact, made a difference about outcomes that people actually care about. So when we can get to a point where uh, we can show that artificial intelligence has actually saved lives, uh, where it saves substantial amount of dollars, I think that's when people really start paying attention because it's those outcomes that I think will drive behavior um, versus any of the kind of niceties around understanding. Jason, I see you're coming off mute. So I, I think, and in, in there's obviously been a lot of research and studies around how best to educate and communicate the value of AI, whether it's in clinical settings or again, to enable better patient care. Mo most of the outcomes focus on, you know, the clinical decision support rather than you know, replacing physicians and such. It's really about how do you provide clinicians and their partners with robust sets of information that's timely, peer-reviewed, and accessible to them beds at the bedside for the purpose of, again, improving the quality of care, reducing errors, and, and hopefully, again, making their job easier. So I think the discussion has shifted towards what, it, what are some of the greatest limiting factors in terms of clinicians being able to do that today? And, and how can AI help them in their work to achieve these kinds of outcomes? 
And, you know, it is going to be a journey like any other major innovation. But as Mohammed mentioned, it is about establishing some clear use cases where that impact and outcome is clear, not only to those who participated, but to those outside of that particular trial. Thank you for that, Jason. Would love to hear from you as well, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's all about the, really the use case and ensuring that you're really trying to find a problem that resonates with the users and the stakeholders. Um, and then for us, it's been also about including those users and stakeholders in the design of the solution. So, um, and I, I actually, I would add to that too, you know, the approach has always been not, you know, we're going to use AI to make the decision for you. <laughs> the approach has always been, no, we want to help you make those decisions, but ultimately, you know, the control is still with you because you are the ultimate decision maker and also the expert, right? So really it's been about that approach of, you know, the tool that I can give you to enable your job um, and then involving those stakeholders and users, both in the design and then as well as in the rollout. So not necessarily just, you know, handing over an AI tool, but actually working side by side with the users of the tool so that you understand, number one, has it been designed for the right user experience? Um, you know, is it actually uh, addressing the problems that they have at hand? Um, are they able to use it to tweak to what they need in terms of the information? Because sometimes, you know, the information that may be presented to them may not be the right information or may not even be enough information. Uh, so all of those things, I think, help with both the adoption as well as the change management and then the buy-in for additional opportunities later for AI. Thank you for that. I think you, you've touched on a point of, uh, which is really our, our transition maybe to slide uh, two on the use cases. And Jason, I see you coming off mute to probably add on to that. So maybe your, your reflections can yeah. kick us off in terms of uh, successes that you've seen, use cases that are really driving adoption and, and practice that people can maybe reference and, and provide a little bit more insights into. Yeah, and, and thanks. It was a good segue because I think Jennifer brought up some good points, which is I think your point is critical about who you involve and how you involve people in solution design development and rollout is critical. I would say I would even extend that to the use case development itself. So what's the biggest problem we see in the use cases is people have a lack of faith in the generalizability and the scalability of the outcomes of those use cases to their institution or to their practices. And so I think what we what we have to get better at is who we involve in determining the, the optimum use cases that will, again, resonate not just in the setting in which it's piloted, but more broadly. And, you know, some of, some of the work that we've done within the Canadian healthcare system that has done that, which is to, to ask our sponsors, like, you know, when you look at the outcomes, like, who are, who are these outcomes going to apply to? How is it going to ultimately impact on either patient experience, clinician practice, or a combination within? And then work your way backwards to say, you know, how, how can you actually design those use cases to then have as broad an applicability as possible? And I think that that's how we start to drive adoption is to say these are not limited in the context in which they're introduced, but rather they are examples of how this can be done more broadly. So I want to maybe um, shift it over then to Jennifer, um, because it, it does touch on to the maturity that an organization needs to have, not only in terms of its infrastructure, data, uh, from a community setting, there are a lot of different inputs. would love to get your take on some of the use cases and um, even how you're, you're uh, rolling them out to actually um, support uh, adoption and spread uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, for sure. So, you know, when we talk about use cases, for us in particular, um, we wanted to get something that kind of resonated throughout the organization because it's kind of our first foray into AI within SE. Um, for us, we chose one of our, um, you know, major risk areas, which is human, human resource risk. And that's really something that is uh, recognized and felt <laughs> deeply from, you know, our CEO down to every, you know, care provider that's going into someone's home. So um, when it comes to, you know, how can we then do more without the ability to increase staff given the industry shortage, um, that's where we decided to see like, you know, what could we actually do? 
Um, I would echo that data literacy um, was also a challenge when we were looking at um, the solution. So we really wanted to make sure that we were understanding where people were at in terms of data literacy so that we could um, you know, accommodate or um, make sure that we're um, taking that to account when we're when we were developing the solution, but also the rollout. So the particular use case we decided to go with for SE uh, for our uh, first challenge, and that was um, we're actually teaming up with Deloitte to do that, is a team geography optimization. So really, what it is is it's a um, it takes into account AI driven forecasting. So historically, we were looking at you know historical volumes, but not predicting volumes based on client demographics, trends we are seeing in the, in the community, et cetera. So we wanted to be able to have an actual AI-driven forecast that will then feed into a tool that allows teams to optimize their, uh, their staffing geographically uh, in terms of team mm -hmm. boundaries. So the purpose of it is to drive visibility to staffing requirements, which is crucial for recruitment, as well as just overall capacity management. Um, and then also for us to be able to increase our capacity by reducing the average travel distances between visits. Uh, clinically, it also provides the right foundation for us to be um, drive, you know, higher client continuity of care. Again, everything kind of revolves around our ability to provide capacity. Uh, and so really with, um, with this particular project, we're actually finding our initial findings suggest that we can reduce our average travel distance per visit by over 30%. And really that frees up about two to three percent of additional capacity, which may not sound very much, but at the end of the day, two to three percent uh, equates to about two to three thousand additional visits that we can do That's per it. week, which you know has a significant impact on additional clients who are on wait lists for care. Um, and then in terms of you know what approach we've taken on that change management rollout. As I mentioned, it's been really critical for us to include stakeholders and users across the design, um, everybody from our leadership team to our clinical managers to coordinators and schedulers, because they all have a part to play when it comes to the operational and capacity management. Uh, and as we start to roll out, we're really working side by side with those regional teams to take it from theory uh, into reality. And part of the beauty of the solution that we're providing, again, is the opportunity for uh, our teams to adjust the outputs that the tool provides. So it's not about kind of handing over an optimized geography and saying, okay, you know, go and actually implement it. It's about providing, you know, some of that uh, data, but then also giving them the ability to create custom scenarios if there are uh, geographic, uh, nuances, uh, cultural nuances that they need to account for that they know better really than anyone else. Uh, and so that allows them to then um, roll out what they think is best for their for their uh, for their uh, geography. And, and then lastly, I would just say that in order for us to continue on this AI journey, um, we're really providing like a tech transformation. Uh, to be able to um, complement some of the work that we're doing. So we're really investing in and enhancing our data and analytics teams, our business and uh, business intelligence, but as well as adding data scientists into our uh, staff. Um, fulsome assessments of our data architecture and sources are really key uh, to be able to enable more of those AI opportunities going forward. Wow, that is in Impressive, <laughs> impressive to say the least, especially for uh, communities, care and community setting. Would love to hear um, what Unity Health is doing and some of the use cases that have uh, been pushed forward. Sure, thanks. Um, I think uh, at Unity Health, we're very fortunate. Um, we're the only hospital in the country where our CEO has declared artificial intelligence as a strategic priority. In fact, it's one of the three top strategic priorities for the institution. So we have an actual AI living lab. Um, with uh, a team of uh, close to 30 data scientists uh, that I lead. And we've developed and deployed live in production as we speak. There are over 40 solutions, most of them using machine learning and AI to drive uh, uh, clinical care. So we have quite a few uh, examples. They focus around automation, optimization, clinical decision support. In the interest of time, maybe I'll just go over a couple of examples. 
Uh, the way our model works though, is that our data scientists don't drive the questions. The questions have to come from our end users. To Jennifer's point, that end user engagement is absolutely critical. So it's our frontline staff that'll say, hey, this is the problem that I have that I need you to work on. So the, the problems don't come from the data science team. What we do is we work very, very closely with our end users to, to co-create solutions that will be effective for our end users. So uh, one example that comes to mind, and again, we've got over 40 of these, is our emergency department nurses came to us and they said, you know, one of our top stressors is assigning our nurses to the different emergency department zones. And we said, really? That sounds really boring. <laughs> they said, no, 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 <laughs> this is actually really, really important for us. And there's all sorts of rules that a junior nurse has to be with the senior nurse, has to be with the team lead. The same nurse can't work in the same zone over the past 48 hours. And there's all sorts of rules that they have to adhere to. And as soon as somebody calls in sick, which happens all the time, they've got to redo everything. So their key uh, issue is number one, it takes us a lot of time from clerical staff to team lead and stuff. We spend about four hours a day on this exercise every day on Excel spreadsheets and paper and such. The other thing is because we have to keep track of everything and it's just really difficult for us to do. The other thing is repeat rates are very difficult for us because we want to minimize those. These are the, the rates where the same nurses work in the same zones and such. It's just for, for uh, it's a process metric that they really, really are fixated on. It's at around 21%. And that's really high. Right. Wow. So uh, we created an algorithm. It's, it, uh, it's mostly an optimization algorithm, but it's, it's individual level where it basically watches, quote unquote, the nurses in terms of who they work with, where they work, when they work. And uh, you click the button and it'll actually set your ne next assignment schedule for the next four days. And uh, what happens is if somebody calls in sick, you just have to say sick, push the button, and it'll reassess. So uh, what we've seen is post-deployment, um, the amount of time that was spent went down from, and this was deployed, I think, about three years ago, uh, went down from over four hours a day to under 15 minutes. And uh, the repeat rate went from over 20% to under 5% uh, in very short order. So now this is, again, used very routinely every day, all day. Um, Another example that may be um, more important for patient outcomes is uh, something called ChartWatch. It's basically an early warning system. So all of our general internal medicine patients at St. Michael's Hospital and now our surgical patients in general surgery uh, on the 16th floor of St. Michael's Hospital are monitored by ChartWatch and we're aggressively now expanding hospital-wide into other hospitals as well, where the concept here is very simple. What the algorithm does, and it's been running since October of 2020, so it's been over two years of experience that we have now. Um, what it does is every hour on the hour, it grabs data from all of our patients. And for each one of our patients, it uh, categorizes them as business. So uh, more technical difficulty in terms of recording, but I, again, impressive in terms of not only the scope and, and breadth of what is in, what can be impacted with just the applications of something that's a predictive modeling like that. I would love to understand sort of the impact of COVID and, and just seeing sort of what has modeled before and after, but also want to bring in Jason. Jason, I know your uh, purview across the healthcare system is vast and, and differs. Uh, any use cases that really stand out to you um, that you could probably share with the audience? Yeah, happy to. Um, and again, these will be kind of two of a much broader set, but some of the principles Mohammed and Jennifer already talked about. So what are the two areas where I'm seeing some of the greatest demand for AI in healthcare? One is, which again has been touched upon, is, you know, digital twinning, simulation modeling type of work. You know, more and more organizations that are looking at processes and flow and trying to understand whether or not there's opportunities to change those processes and what and what impact those changes would have. So, you know, a good example is things like ER operations, reducing wait times within emergency rooms, potentially diverting patients who are coming into ER that could otherwise be helped by services within the community. Lots of ideas as to how different initiatives could again curb those wait times. 
But to Mohammed's earlier points, in the life sciences part of it, the, the approach to date has been a lot of throwing things at it and then seeing what the impact is and then making a decision whether or not it was the right thing to do. More and more institutions wanting to model those behaviors and say, can you develop kind of a digital twin of our operation that says, if we, for example, divert 25% of our low CTAS patients who are typically coming to ER into urgent care centers or into uh, community-based primary care clinics, what impact that would that have on wait times? What impact would it have on average length of stay? But even more structural things, which is can you, can you actually change how patients are triaged and seen and admitted within acute care facilities? And again, modeling structural changes to a department to say what impact would those changes have you know if you had an initial triage if you had a if you had again a different model for how those patients ultimately are assessed and so we're seeing an increasing desire to build out more sophisticated models of operations to be able to test different scenarios and model impact so that's that's one the second i would say which is i think more foundational is you know, we all know in a healthcare system and jennifer raised this before a huge huge amounts of data that data is ultimately um, collected typically in very fit for purpose systems. So systems that were not meant to integrate, they were not standardized to other systems. They are really, they were built fit for purpose and in many cases have operated for decades within those forms. You know, a lot of the challenge to date has been how do you so-called modernize your infrastructure to be able to make that data more accessible, but, but not really a desire to do a whole bunch of legacy retirement or you know, massive IT investment. So one of the things we've been seeing is how do you actually extract that data and standardize it at a more of an integration layer rather than again, modernizing and redeveloping the source systems. And so we've seen an increasing desire to bring in machine learning solutions that sit on top of multiple source solutions and do the data standardization, do the metadata standardization and, and basically create an interaction layer, whether it's for clinicians or planners or decision makers, to interact with that data at a layer that looks all integrated and feels all integrated, but actually doesn't rely on source integration. That, that we're seeing more and more desire for because it gets around some of the kind of capital infrastructure investments, decisions that have often been barriers to modernizing IT infrastructure. So Jason, are we at risk in any of these organizations that you've encountered of just producing data lakes? So healthcare has a lot of data. Uh, sometimes not all of it is accessible. How do we, um, how do we come, it's not really combat, but how do we deal with the deluge of information that everybody has to contend with, interpret, and then as uh, Dr. Mamdani has said, create a prognosis. Yeah. Uh, this you could have a whole webinar on this topic <laughs> alone for future um, webcasts. I think, I think a couple of things. When is that the sheer breadth of data is at least partially due to the fact that there's a huge amount of duplication of data collection happening throughout the system. So when you actually start to look at single source of truth and you know single collection for multiple uses, you you do start to address some of the volume of breadth um, challenges. The other thing, and this gets back to a point Mohammed made earlier, which is we have to return to a state where we're actually working backwards from the needs of your clinicians and the needs of your patients and healthcare system, and then determine what, what data do you need to satisfy those needs. The reality is there's a lot of data collection happening across the country that again is legacy. And we, we've done multiple assessments where we say, okay, let's look at this, this set of reports based on this set of data and understand the end use of it. And what have we found? Many of those reports haven't been used in years. But the reality is that the question is not being asked as routinely and frequently as it should be. There should be a consistent feedback loop between what's being collected, how it's being used for reporting, and whether or not, again, that use is justified based on the effort involved in, again, collecting and reporting on the information. The more we do that, we start to rationalize what, what is like the truly that core data set that's necessary for clinical and patient and, and public use versus all the noise that surrounds it. And I'll, I'll stop it. Maybe again, um, one of the other panelists has other inputs. So I want to be also mindful of time and, and the fact that we actually have quite a few questions in, in our chat and our Q&A. So I do want to uh, want everybody to, um, or the panelists at least, to touch briefly on the future 
the future of AI in healthcare before we open it up to some of the panel questions. And I want to maybe even layer on this question because it has been such a buzz topic uh, overall since the start of this year is generative AI. Um, any thoughts about how that will um, impact some of the work you do or even some of the use cases that you have under your uh, purview as well? So probably one minute per question just so that we can um, be mindful of the questions that are in the chat. Maybe I, can start I see. With, uh, I see Mohammed going off off uh, yeah. mute. Yeah, go ahead. Go for sure. it. Sure. So uh, yeah, again, very very briefly. I think there's there's an incredible amount of activity that we should be expecting in the future. A survey of a thousand healthcare professionals, uh, healthcare professional leaders, suggests about forty percent of respondents are already using AI. So this is not something that we can just hum and haw about. This is coming, and it's going to be coming very fast. Where I think it's going to be incredibly helpful for us, um, as Jason points out, there's lots of use cases here, especially around the emergency department. Uh, but that's, you know, acute care, but also home care um, and community setting as we get more and more into wearables. That is a really, really challenging area. Uh, the acute side, I think, will be a bit easier to address. But in terms of um, uh, new innovations and, let's say, transformer-based models uh, that are striving more generative, uh, generative adversarial models and such, I, I think the, the improvements in methodologies will, will keep coming. I don't think it's going to really um, fundamentally change how we do things in the, in the short term, though. I think, uh, for example, ChatGPT um, is based on this transformer technology that was that's been about around for about four years now. Um, so it's not new. Uh, it's just it takes us a little bit of time to catch up. And I see more and more of these methods advancements happening, but us being the culprits in terms of how quickly we can adapt. Great insights. How about you, Jennifer? What are your thoughts about the future of AI in healthcare? So, I mean, I think that obviously it looks like there's lots of there's lots of things that are being done. For us in particular, I think we see lots of potential. Uh, in addition to, you know, enabling that timely and informed decision making, I think specifically there's lots of opportunity in optimizing integrated care especially as we move away from fee-for-service and uh, start to connect those disparate, disparate data sets to have a better view across you know, a client experience uh, across the system. Um, I think that uh, you know, when it you know, comes to our quadruple aim, right? better outcomes, lower total costs, patient and provider experience, I can probably name off a bunch of different things within each of those areas where we could apply AI. One of the things that I just kind of came to mind too, as we were discussing, you know, in terms of like, you know, are we collecting the right data? Um, in some cases, even though we have so much data, in, in some cases we're not. So I think that that's going to be, you know, uh, crucial to ensure that we're collecting the right data, but then also not burden, burdening our, you know, uh, clinical teams uh, to collect that data. So I think that there's also opportunity there to be able to streamline that process um, to get the right data, but also not to burden our teams in, you know, um, drop down forms, et cetera, <laughs> uh, to be able to get the right information. So I think there's lots that AI can do for that, especially again, when I think about home care and the time that we're able to spend in people's homes, I'm sure it's the same for, you know, uh, acute care and, and primary providers as well. Um, the other thing I'll just add is I really have seen their value in, you um, engaging external partners, um, so not necessarily doing everything in-house. Um, for us specifically, especially because we're relatively new to the journey, it's been really great, um, you know, engaging Deloitte uh, and having them as a partner to challenge our concepts and some of our gut feels, because um, I can even say, you know, as somebody coming from outside healthcare and being here for, for you know, five or six years, uh, you, you may bring a different perspective that can challenge the status quo or the norms or the concepts that people have. And so I think as we then continue down the AI journey, there's definitely value um, in being able to, um, to, to partner with external folks outside of the organization and sometimes outside of healthcare to be able to draw on some of those synergies from other industries, but as well as just to get a different perspective. Great insights. Thank you for that, Jennifer. And I love the idea of having a sounding, sounding board to just challenge your, your thinking. Jason, um, a couple of thoughts from you before we go to uh, audience questions. I'll just echo what Jennifer said and I can't stress enough, like how often we hear about the need to have a more integrated healthcare system and to facilitate more seamless transitions of care. 
whether it's from acute care to home care to long-term care, primary care, you know, the challenges that exist, including, you know, access to data, sharing of data, standardization, um, patients' access to their own information to facilitate their care journey. I think that the trend is, for lots of reasons, better patient experience, better clinical access to, to relevant data, more efficient care. All these things, again, have roots in, again, data, AI, and infrastructure. So when we start to look at, again, how we can facilitate more seamless transitions and a better patient experience, better clinical experience, AI enters that equation in so many places, including, again, more integrated data, including, again, facilitated access to uh, transitions of care, including, you know, simulation modeling and, and clinical decision making. And so I think part of, part of what I see is that the future is starting to think of these things not as, again, individual use cases, but how they ultimately fit within a broader scheme to improve patients' interaction with the healthcare system and improve clinicians' ability to deliver the best quality care. Thank you for that, Jason. And with that, let's open it up to some audience questions. The first one coming from Ganesh. A lot of application for AI healthcare uh, relates to patient care. Is there any advancements or value in exploring AI to improve medical education? So I think uh, by default, uh, this is going to Dr. Mandadi <laughs> for your intake on that one. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, first of all, I mean, I, I think we've got to take a human-based approach to actually um, drive um, data literacy and AI literacy, first and foremost. Um, and how can actually AI be used to drive better education? There's all sorts of applications here. Um, one, I think it can be used in, a, in maybe a detrimental way. <laughs> so, you know, we've heard all those stories with ChatGPT being used by students now to write their essays. Um, and it's hard to tell them apart from, from human essays. So um, I think we've got to kind of keep an eye on around misuse of AI in education. But other areas where I've seen, um, you know, we haven't done this ourselves, but we've uh, seen some pretty interesting work by other places where they actually are able to identify in advance students may, who may struggle versus students who may not struggle and um, uh, assessing different types of learning patterns to say, well, this student may actually be more amenable to this sort of an approach around education versus that sort of an approach. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of this work around how AI can help us not only deliver uh, education materials, that I think is, is probably the easier part around allocating to whom what sorts of materials, but understanding what types of people um, can learn how they can learn and who are who's more likely to succeed versus not succeed in some of our education programs. Hmm. That's good, good insights onto that one. The next question is about wearable technology and the literacy around it. So uh, this uh, response or audience member finds that a lot of patients struggle with understanding the data from their wearable watches, i.e. understanding sleep cycles, uh, females for understanding their menstrual cycles. So even though we are providing people, I guess, with these tools, what is the information that is um, conveyed it can also be a challenge. Any thoughts or, or insights onto maybe providing too much data can also be a little bit of a paradox. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mohammed. So I'm, I'm smiling because um, you know we we learned maybe a little bit the hard way around the importance of human factors, the importance of design considerations, the importance of um, uh, software development in a way where you're creating a solution that actually really gets at your end user. So uh, for example, in our program, we have three teams. We have a data integration and governance team. And they're the data engineers, the architects and models that really get the data pipelines and clean and scrub that data and get it ready for the, uh, the algorithm ingestion, which goes to the second team, which is the advanced analytics team. And the advanced analytics team does the fancy schmancy modeling, the neural networks and uh, the optimization models and such. They get into all that stuff, but they, they're working with good data. So it's more efficient because the data integration governance team has, has helped them. But the third team, and I'm saying the number three, but we actually start with this team is a product development team. Oh. That's headed up by an artist. And um, the artist is actually has a focus. Now he actually did a master of science in applied computing. Um, so he has that kind of lens around machine learning, but he's very interested in human AI interaction and design. How do we actually convey, because our output from the machine learning model is gonna be incomprehensible to most people, but how do we convey it in a manner where people can walk away and understand, okay, this is what I need to do with it. And that uptake then is just so much better because it's designed with that end user in mind. That comes first. 
Otherwise, you're just going to create a solution that nobody can use. I uh, see uh, Jason and Jennifer nodding. Go ahead, Jason. I was just going to say, I'd hazard to say it extends well beyond the wearables realm. I think the same the same principles apply really for any product development, which is if, if you're not clearly starting with your end user needs, how they're going to interact with the outputs of the information and working with your, your way backwards, you're building this you know black box paradigm, right? Where people don't understand how and why it's being collected and therefore they, they lack the trust in the outputs from that system. And that, that has come up time and time again in terms of you know barriers to AI adoption. Jennifer, I see you nodding and do you have uh, additional thoughts? Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, I, we see similar challenges where we um, have, you know, data collected from, you know, patients through wearables, et cetera. I mean, really, it all depends on the context of the data that's being collected. But then it also, you know, there's a, um, there was a reliance on the clinician as well, right, to help understand, you know, what that means to, to the patient. And so I think as we get more and more data, there, I think there is could be an oversaturation of data without understanding the context or the application to uh, the client. And so at the end of the day, it kind of goes back to, you know, is, is this something that we need to know? How does it apply to me? And so it's really the user driven experience, but also, you know, what the user needs and what the client needs. Thank you for that. And I, I do want to convey to everybody on the line, I know, uh, unfortunately, we cannot get to all of your questions. We will convey that them back to the panelists and see what we can address as we send out uh, the recordings as well as information from this session. I do want to thank the panelists for participating in this roundtable discussion and then open it up to you, um, the audience, to help us to inform us on future activities as well as uh, events that we have coming in the forward in the future. So we would not be doing our job unless we understand how we did our job. So as a data-driven approach, we would love to get your feedback on how we did and also uh, comments on future sessions that we have coming forward. And to be as topical as possible, we do have a discussion on generative AI coming forward in February the 28th. We'd love to see you in attendance for that one. But uh, with the time that we have, we'd love to get your feedback and thank the panelists for their participation in, participation in this discussion. Thank you all. So the poll is live. Uh, feel free to uh, respond and we'll leave this up as uh, as we're going out or signing out for the session. So this will be up um, for a little bit, but thank you all for participating. And uh, though we didn't kick off the session, Happy New Year to all. Wishing everybody a great AI start to the new year.